Hello and welcome to the Egg on Air live stream with Ashvarya Srinivasan. I'm Gia Mirando, Director of Marketing here at Data IQ, and I'm excited to be joined by Ashvarya as she discusses real world use cases for tackling data privacy with federated learning. Thanks so much for joining us today, Ashvarya. Thank you so much, Gia. So before we dive into the talk, I wanted to share a bit about her many accomplishments. Ashvarya Srinivasan is a data scientist in IBM's data science and AI elite team, researching machine learning and reinforcement learning. She is very focused on expanding her horizons in the machine learning research community, including her recent patent award won in 2018 for developing a reinforcement learning model for machine trading. Ashvarya is a postgraduate in data science from Columbia University. During her engagement, she primarily focuses on bringing in machine learning research to create business value, working with clients all across the globe. She is an ambassador for the women in data science community, actively organizes events and conferences to inspire budding data scientists, and has been spotlighted as a LinkedIn Top Voice 2020 for data science and AI, which features the top 10 machine learning influencers across the world. So I know you were all eager to hear from her. So Ashvarya, I will pass the floor to you. Thank you so much, Jaya. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Uh, let me know if it's visible. OK, uh, it is visible, right? Uh, Jia, could you confirm if it's visible? Yes, it, it's visible. Okay, perfect. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about like tackling data privacy. So in the recent past, we have seen a lot of uh, advancements in data science and machine learning algorithms all through different industries. And uh, one of the side effects of these technology being incorporated into um, like industrial use cases or uh, things which are productionalized and are touching customers, there has been a huge issue of data privacy. Because still now, uh, most of the AI technologies were um, experimental and they were not productionized or they, they were not in the industrial pipelines. But uh, now that we, uh, as customers, are uh, um, like the, uh, with any sort of like uh, algorithm and human data interaction, there have been a lot of concerns around what happens with these data and how they could be um, like used in negative senses or. Uh, if they could have an ill effect going on in future. And in the recent past, we have also seen a lot of companies getting into trouble because uh, of violating data privacy issues. So um, federated learning is something which um, has been in research for, for a while now. And with more and more data privacy issues coming into the picture with uh, with different uh, different industrial use cases, federated learning has become a really uh, interesting topic or a really crucial uh, way of implementing uh, machine learning machine learning algorithms or machine learning technology in a much secure way. So I'm going to be quickly talking about uh, different data privacy issues and uh, what data is being used in different industries. And then we would be heading towards federated learning. So a little about myself, I think Gia covered most of it. Uh, I am a data scientist in IBM Data Science Elite team. I work out of, out of New York. Uh, I have a master's in data science from Columbia University. Prior to, the, prior to that, I had a undergraduate degree in computer science uh, from Weller Institute of Technology. Um, as she mentioned, I had been spotlighted as a LinkedIn top voice in 2020. Um, I have been like a very uh, frequent user of LinkedIn, and I really love to share my thoughts and ideas with the community. And I also try to engage as much as I could with the community. I uh, have been trying to mentor people for uh, their career in data science or undergraduate and graduate students who are trying to understand which focus area would be better for them in, in data science and how should they pursue. Or uh, data science being a multi-industry uh, uh, a multi-industry domain. Um, how could people coming in, um, say, from mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, could actually pursue something which is related to data science? And um, I'm also a huge advocate of women in data science. I have been working with with Stanford community for about three years now, and I, I really love engaging uh, with the community. And uh, I organize events and hackathons uh, where we. Uh, try to see how advancements have been going on in AI and data science all through different industries. So um, just a quick 
of what we would be talking about today, uh, we would try to understand the data utility. Uh, wh why are the companies collecting this data? What are they going to do with this? So there's a huge factor on uh, what this data is being used for within each industries. And we have been hearing the same thing over and over again from a lot of people, Sianju NG and a lot of other influencers calling data as the new electricity, data as the next big thing, et cetera. Why is that happening? Because the business model of the companies have very effectively changed in the recent past. Uh, when we talk about applications like Facebook or Instagram or um, like Snapchat, et cetera, we think that, hey, I'm able to use these services for free. But if you carefully um, assess it, are we getting to use the service for free or are they getting our data for free? We technically are their products. They are uh, extracting every, every possible information about us and they are using that in different manner. Um, then we would be talking about data privacy and we would be going more about um, how, how could it affect you in different ways and what could be the possible uh, ways of um, data being misused in different industries. Um, and the third section would be about the trade-off between data utility and privacy. So when it comes to uh, building machine learning models, it's, it, it's a very common uh, saying that garbage in and garbage up. So if you are providing your machine learning model with high quality data, that is when your model would be effectively able to uh, predict or like, uh, you know, artificially create this um, pattern uh, understanding what is being happening with your data. But if we are not providing it with enough data, then the entire purpose of recommendation systems and predictive analytics would actually not work, right? So um, for any industry to work really on a better, um, like in a better format with these machine learning models, it is uh, very crucial for them to have high quality data. But with more and more data comes a trade-off for privacy. So how do we handle that? And then uh, we would touch base on federated learning, what federated learning is. And I would uh, get into the deeper uh, weeds of federated learning, talking about the uh, frequently asked questions about, uh, you know, what are the nits and bits in federated learning, which you need to know about. And then we would be going over some of the case studies uh, from different industries where federated learning could be a really, um, uh, would be a really good place to apply it. And finally, we'll end it with uh, takeaways. So going to what is this data being, uh, like what data is being collected? So if you look at different industries, there could be broad, in a broader sense, four different categories of data. One is a personal data. So within personal data, uh, it encompasses things like your social security number, your email addresses, your browser cookies, your uh, date of birth, everything and anything which you enter in that and which talks about you, right? Your personal information, that's the personal data. Uh, the second section is the engagement data. So what comes in the engagement data is basically how a consumer or a customer is interacting with their websites, how they are interacting with their applications or uh, emails or uh, how they are responding to uh, these technologies coming in from a company. The third section is basically the behavioral data. So these behavioral data is more towards a qualitative data, which talks about uh, what sort of purchases is this person making? Um, what sort of repeated action is this person taking? Is there any pattern in his behavior? That, that section gets captured in the behavioral data. And the fourth section is the attitudinal data. So within attitudinal data, we talk about what is the reaction of the customers on these technologies. And when you say reaction, it could be say product reviews. It could be a, um, uh, what changes would they expect want in, in a particular service or product. And um, when they are uh, making any sort of purchases, what are their feedback on that? So these are the broader four categories of data which is uh, coming through in every industry. And these are major and being analyzed for building better models. So if we see like, what is this data being used for? So um, just a quick example, we can think about a e-commerce site and imagine that the e-commerce site is collecting all the data which I just mentioned. So what could they be possibly using it for? to in, improve your customer experience. They want you that whenever you're visiting them, 
natural human experience they are able to uh, predict it earlier what would you what would be the next thing you might buy and stock up their inventory to from your uh, your location like the nearest inventory on your location so that whenever you're ordering something that product reaches to you as soon as possible so all this contains a lot and lot of predictive analysis and this is again all for your benefit right so the companies are trying to build all these um, algorithms and models just so that your experience on their platform is improved so again, in turn, when this is happening, the company's marketing strategy is getting, getting better and better because more and more users are going to be turn up to your, turn up to your website and more and more customers are going to be willing to use your product. So how is this going to help? transform their data into cash flow. So with a lots and lots of data, they are trying to see how they can uh, utilize this information and build better products or build better way of delivering you the products with which they are uh, getting higher revenues. So when this is happening, there will be more people turning into the website. There'll be more people trying to order. There'll be more people giving you the feedback that in turn will give them more data. So securing more data with these analytics is also very important for them. Now, uh, talking about data privacy. So what is data privacy? If, if someone is absolutely new to data privacy, I want to give a little uh, like preface before getting into the uh, getting into the weeds of it. So data privacy is basically how any piece of information that is your information is being accessed without your knowledge or without your authorization. So when it comes to um, like artificial intelligence models, uh, it does require a lot of information, right? So each and everything which you text uh, to someone, like each and everything you enter on your keypad, everything is being tracked somewhere or the other. Each and everything that you do on your phone, you do with your clock, you do with your laptop, you do with your tablet, etc. Each and everything is being tracked, even to the details of uh, what is the time of your alarm that you set every day, what is your sleeping patterns over the weekdays versus the weekends, uh, what are, what are the frequently used words that you use in your uh, texting patterns, etc. So these are really, really sensitive information. Um, you would not want someone to uh, use this information in, in a way that is not known to you, right? One of the examples which I came across recently and um, which truly uh, like scared me was uh, a, a use case that happened with Strava. So what we saw is that they had published a, um, a dashboard which was talking about different uh, areas of the world where people have been really active with their workouts. Uh, like people have been logging about their walks, their runs and different exercises, right? And uh, like, what, what do you think is the potential problem here? Seems like a great interface, right? You can see, hey, like these are the most active, actively working out countries. These are the uh, countries which are uh, lacking uh, physical exercises, etc. But what was a scary part there is that unknowingly, the people like uh, the United States um, camps, which was there in um, like Middle Eastern countries, got revealed in that data mm -hmm. because uh, there were army professionals who were logging in their workout data and their bases, which was ideally not supposed to be um, like not supposed to be uh, publicized, was being public. That is a huge issue. So they had to, of course, like take down the dashboard. But if you think about it, you uh, would not be able to uh, predict in advance what could be the ill effect or your side effect of the models or uh, the activities using machine learning that you're trying to do. Um, like the intentions was not to reveal that data, but it happened so, right? So even companies who are uh, right now into uh, different kinds of technology products and uh, who are engaging with a lot of client information or customer information, they would not be intending to do anything wrong with your information. But what could be a side effect is not known even to them. So that is one of the major concerns here. So uh, there have been a lot of guidelines on uh, what data is being captured by different companies and why it is supposed to be uh, revealed to the customers. 
a lot of uh, like initiatives a lot of um, efforts around gdpr uh, we also have the californian consumer privacy act which restricts uh, companies to capture data without the customer's knowledge so if you're using any of the application in the uh, area and like uh, in california then you would be uh, you would be sent notifications or intimation about your data being used in these different places and uh, without your knowledge your data will not be collected so these are a lot of efforts which are being put uh, by governmental organizations so that they can maintain your privacy. And um, talking about this trade-off, right? We want to see that the companies are achieving their goals. They are able to provide you with the best services. They are able to capture your uh, um, like your activities, they are able to predict the best products for you. They are able to give you the uh, best way to. Um, you know, um, whenever you're, let's say, ordering things, uh, you get the uh, best supplies as soon as possible, or you get, um, like, before you even, like, know what all things you buy, you can get, like, uh, intimated uh, predictions for the products. That is great. You want to have all these things. You want to uh, to wake up every morning with a set of news, which is exactly what you wanted. You don't want to sit and search about particular news. So these sort of recommendation systems is needed for the people. And uh, such personalizations is definitely very uh, very useful for the customers, but not on the compromise while not compromising the data privacy. So this trade off. How do we settle that? We can settle that if the data itself is being nurtured or itself is being kept in a place which would not violate the privacy, which would not um, give out the individual data points where we are able to extract the essence of the data while the data still stays secure with you. So that is the entire concept of federated learning. So this is a the little video that I had found online, uh, which is really interesting. And you can see that while everyone is using their phones, what federated learning is doing is instead of your data going on to their clouds or their servers, a small chunk of their machine learning models uh, parameters would be coming into your phone. And the model would be enhanced and trained on your data on your device itself. And once it is updated, the data or the model weights, uh, not the data, the model weights go back to the cloud, go back to the servers of these companies. And that's when they are able to uh, improve their models and uh, serve you with better analytics. So here, as you see, that your data is not leaving your premises. The data is still in your device. And there is no way for a company to be able to uh, misuse this data in any form. In, in any form. So um, if I were to summarize this, uh, it is a way in which you're uh, decentralizing the model training. You are not collecting the data. The companies are not collecting the data, but they are decentralizing the model training where they have a base model and that model weights is being sent to your device. Your data is being used to train that small model and the updated weights is being sent back to the server. Now, what is happening is this is a collaborative effort. So millions and millions of users are retraining the, these small model parameters using their personalized data and that uh, updated weights go back to the server. And that's when it gets collaborated and that's when it gets aggregated to improve their overall machine learning models. So uh, this is like a very basic crux of what's happening in uh, federated learning. Now talking about like, so, okay, my data is being used to train these models which are coming to my device. So is there a way that this model weight can be re-engineered or like reverse engineered to find your data? Absolutely not. That's definitely a concern which uh, the like, um, the researchers of federated learning did come up with. So you don't have to worry about that because uh, they have also uh, a, a completed uh, secure aggregation with it. So what secure aggregation does is that it is an interactive cryptographic protocol. So it is basically summing up different uh, mask vectors and uh, like, like, for example, the model weights, right? So uh, it works by coordinating the exchange of random masks among pairs 
for as the mass cancel out when the fission number of inputs are received so this basic uh, version will make it in a way that even the server would not be having that encryption key they would have uh, they would have the key that would be effectively uh, decrypting the entire model but they cannot decrypt any of the individual model parameters which are coming in so if you see on the left image uh, each and every triangle is a new model or uh, new model trained that is coming from different devices and these are individually encrypted and these cannot be de decrypted by the model individually when they are collectively uh, collectively like um, set together that is when uh, the server would be able to decrypt this collaborated mo uh, collaborated uh, model training and um, another um, like another concern that happens is that what if the model captures some very specific data? So um, out of say 2.1 million people who are being um, who are actually like inputting their data into the uh, into the uh, into the server, what if there are uh, like five or six people who are really really different? Uh, they could be like really high officials in the government. They could be uh, high authoritative people. What if their very specifically different data can get uh, can get recognized in the entire model training when when the data is going there? So again, not a concern because federated within federated learning this aspect has also been captured and what is happening is that they are not trying to build models to capture specific data what they are trying to capture is uh, the number of people who are using the application the model uh, is able to capture patterns which are most likely similar to a, a good bunch of people. And it's not like individual uh, rare activities. So the rarity is not going to be captured. So that's where the differential uh, privacy comes into the picture. <clears throat> so what is differential privacy is that it is a very established way to deal with the model memorization. So the model is not going to memorize each and every small character in the model data. Whereas what it'll be doing, it'll be trying to capture the major patterns in the data. So uh, the model uh, parameters will not be influenced by any single contributor. Um, <clears throat> so once uh, the model is trained, so the the e-commerce website we, which we have been talking about, let's let's take their example again. So now they have collected all your information and they have trained a really good model on their end. How do they test it? How do they see if it is really effective or not? That is again done on your devices. So what they would be doing is uh, they would be selecting uh, A/B testing. Um, customers like they'll be choosing a bunch of customers on which they'll be trying to test out these models and the model would be again sent to your device using your data it would be tested again so your feedback on the on the uh, on the predictions of the model are again captured and these results are sent back to the server so the model training again is happening on your device your data is not leaving your device isn't that great? Mm -hmm. So uh, when it comes to like applications of federated learning, it is like data science. Like data science is applicable in a lot of industries. Every industry having data needs data science, right? So uh, recently, uh, with my experience, I have uh, most mostly worked with financial uh, industrial use cases, and uh, it so happened that it it intrigues me a lot because that is one of the industries which is really sensitive because there is a lot of monetary risk attached to it. So one of the use case which I came across recently and I started uh, working like using federated learning for this use case was anti-money laundering. It is one of the uh, most to crack using machine learning or for that matter any algorithm because it is so diverse, it is so different, each and every case is so different from each other that it takes like a lot and lot of data and a lot of and lot and lot of uh, hyperparameter optimization, you're understanding the features um, for you to build a reasonably good model. So uh, when it comes to anti-money laundering, we know that there are 
a lot of different banks, right, who have been capturing data of the cases of money land laundering that they have captured in their organization. Now, there are, let's say, 100 different banks, and each and every bank has a different set of data about their unique variants of anti-money laundering that has happened, uh, money laundering that has happened. So uh, when you're trying to build a data which is um, like uh, which is trying to stop the money laundering happening in different organizations, we would want to collect all the possible data available in all these banks. But is this really viable? Is it possible for you to ask data from different bank in any manner for them to collaborate and build a model together? No. It is very sensitive data, like any form of exposure of these data can be really, really uh, um, can be very critical. So federated learning could be a really good technique here to be used where the models, again, like think about each and every bank as a device, right? You have a base model built in your central arbitrator. Uh, uh, and you are sending these model weights to each and every bank in their systems. Now they are getting these base models uh, downloaded into their servers and they are training these uh, models with their specific data. And whatever is the updated um, model weights is being sent back to the central arbiter. Similar thing happened with each and every bank. Now there are several different model weights uh, sets that have been sent to the central arbiter. And now is when they would be aggregated together and updated for uh, for us to form a really good model for anti-money laundering. Talking about another use case, um, even in medical uh, sciences, uh, data science has been a really critical part. And um, understanding um, if you can use images in a more effective way, images have been uh, one of, uh, again, like one of the most uh, critical informations and uh, it is one of the most difficult data to handle because of their size and the amount of resources which you require to train models using images, right? So uh, even in these cases, different hospitals have a lot of data about say, um, your MRI information from different patients. How do they uh, ensure that these data are still being like uh, secure within their hospital servers with, with the HIPAA uh, uh, rules and everything that's being applied within their organization? So even in this, um, you can apply federated learning where you can have a, uh, a major server uh, as a federated server, so-called here. And we can uh, send a base model's details to each and every different hospital. And they are able to retrain and tune the models based on their data. And the final results are being sent back to the federal server and being aggregated to form a much better tuned model to identify different diseases or uh, any use case based on these image images. So uh, these are like the two use cases or case studies which I wanted to uh, talk to you guys about. Um, there are a lot of other use cases which you can see uh, in tech industries or even in retail or uh, supply chain, etc. in logistics. So um, federated learning is more like a uh, a technique or a facility facilitation technique using which you can have better data analysis, you can have better machine learning models while securing all your crucial data within your organization or within your uh, customer's reach. So uh, if I were to like talk about the major takeaways from today's session, um, we have spoken about how for better personalization, we need better models. And for that, we need better data. And all that data is coming from the customers. So to secure that, we are building centralized machine learning model, which is sitting in one server, while the data which it, it's being trained on is decentralized. So in this case, the data is not really going to the server. The data still stays in the premise of the customer. And the model training is coming to the customer. And in this way, we are making this uh, sweet balance between data privacy and building better models, right? So this was uh, pretty much 
uh, like what I had for today. And um, I'm I'm like really happy that I could share this with you guys. I realized like there's not a lot of information. There's uh, not a lot of uh, awareness about this, uh, about federated learning around. And that is why I, I thought of uh, talking about this. And um, I'm, I'm really, glad to be a part of this session and feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I know we have a Q&A session right now, but um, in case you are seeing this in a recording, uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I would be happy to respond to any of your questions. And uh, Gia, I think uh, I'm done. We can jump on to the Q&A session. Great, thank you so much. We really appreciate you sharing your wealth of knowledge with our audience um, and we have a lot of questions that have been coming in, so we will get right to it. Sure. Let's see. The first question is from Katie, and it is, what is the interplay between federated learning and edge computing? Um, so when it comes to edge computing, uh, the uh, whatever algorithm is being run is running on the um, on the edge itself so um, let's say i have a device and i want uh, a, a specific model to be running from that device the model is set in that device when it collects data it runs through the model but there is no intersection between the device and a uh, main server right whereas in federated learning there is a main server which is like uh, the uh, centralized server where there's an interaction between different devices uh, which is coming to your server and um, there is also another uh, really important difference with federated learning is that any device at any given point in time because it is a customer's device it's your mobile phone you can um, you can choose not to share your information you can choose that not a uh, for the machine learning model not to train on your data. So that with that, there is a data privacy which is being secured. Great. So next question is from Maggie, and it's, are you aware of any guidelines on how many devices are needed to use federated learning successfully, considering there need to be enough devices for training, testing, validation? Um, hi, Maggie. Thank you so much for your question. So uh, there is no magic number here that uh, this is the number of devices which is required for federated learning. It is again like a use case for data science, right? How many rows do you need for a good model? It is enough rows, like it is uh, enough data for the model to understand the different patterns which are existing in that entire data set. So um, when it comes to federated learning, one of the, um, one of the uh, methods is that whenever your data is reaching the federated server, uh, it doesn't get immediately trained. So there is a uh, there is no continuous learning here. So uh, there is independent uh, like data coming to the server, and um, it is um, a unison where it is being trained. So uh, the the machine learning is not being trained on each and every incoming data point. So uh, there has to be enough data, but there's no magic number which I can call out, say 10,000 data points for the federated learning algorithm to work the best. Right, so the next question is from Myra. And what industries do you think will plan to use federated learning in the future? Uh, one industry like which I can think on top of my head is any technical industry, any social media, um, which is accessing your data directly, any retail sector in which uh, things like uh, Instacart, where you're ordering, uh, ordering groceries every time. These industries are also concerned about data privacy. As in when they want better models for you, they want to predict what is the next grocery item you want to buy. They also want to secure your information. So any industry that is interacting directly with customer data would probably be the first ones to apply this. And then probably the trend would start where uh, the federated learning would be applied on a B2B sector, right? Where uh, instead of individuals, having to send like having to train the models using their specific data it'll be organizations like we saw for anti-money laundering use case or the medical use case where there'll be like companies involved in this in this federated learning chain that's a great point all right let's see next question is from anna and it's how does federated learning support continuous training uh, Federated learning uh, right now does not support it continuous training. Uh, right now, it is 
a batch process where um, at every given interval, uh, the all the data which is incoming is combined and then used for retraining. And there are going to be multiple tests which every organization or every industry would be doing on their end before supplying these machine learning models back to your devices for you to test. So uh, there is a entire pipeline in this uh, in this situation. So. It is not going to be the case that uh, every time a person sends in their data, uh, that model is being retrained and sent back to all the users. That is not the case. So it's a batch process and a pipeline is being followed in this entire technique. Great. So you've introduced some excellent points here today, but unfortunately we are nearing the end of our time. So I wanna thank you once again, Ashvarya, for your incredibly insightful talk. And thank you to everyone who joined us live. Um, and I want you all to visit, uh, encourage you to visit the AIG website for updates on new talks, episodes, and to check out all of the on-demand content. So until next time, we'll see you then.